Richard mentioned uh, someone watching on the video just to make sure that, uh, that you're where you say you're going to be, so I need to say hi to my wife. <laughs> Actually, she's supposed to be watching, so I'll ask her when I get back home. Anyway, uh, and I do want to say uh, welcome, uh, or thanks for being here, uh, and to say hi on behalf of all the folks out there in the ministry in San Juan Capistrano, where we're, uh, I truly do consider it a privilege to be able to be here and share the word of God with you. And as Richard mentioned, uh, we do have four boys. Um, and also, we be became grandparents about seven months ago. So let me show you a few pictures of my granddaughter here. So... <laughs> Little Evie, right? <laughs> anyway, she's just uh, a blessing. Where's, where's Alex? Where's Alex? Because they, they became grandparents about uh, seven months. There they are right there. Yeah, so we were, we were dueling pictures a little while ago, right? Yeah, see, she's got her pictures on the cell phone, too. We were checking them out there. So um, anyway, that, that, that truly is a blessing. I, I heard Richard say over the years. Okay, great. Is that better? I heard Richard say over the years what a blessing it was to be grandparents, and you know you don't really know because you can't relate in that sense, and then and then it happens, and it, it really is amazing, and uh, so you two grace believers. But um, okay, I want you to open your Bibles this evening to Colossians uh, chapter number two here. Colossians chapter number two. We've got a lot to cover tonight. Um. And this is, in many ways, kind of a follow-up or a part two, I guess, what you might say to what Brother Brian uh, taught on last night. It's kind of a further development of some of the issues that are, are important to talk about. Um, most of you that have heard me before or, or know that I tend to be more of, um, I usually have like one page and then like an outline and just kind of preach, I guess, what they call extemporaneously just kind of go with it, um, but I've got about six or eight pages of notes here, so what, it's probably going to be a little bit different tonight in, in terms of try, how I try to deliver this, because I'm going to actually read some of this, um, just because I feel like it's important to cover it, um, and so certain parts, is, I'm going to kind of slow down a little bit on purpose, if, if you'll remind me to do so, um, in other parts, we'll just see how it goes. I was telling my wife that when I, I have a real ha bad handwriting as it is anyway. And so whenever I try to write notes down, and I, I do write notes, um, but whenever I try to write notes down, I'll, I'll initially start, and my, my handwriting's pretty good, and then about the second word, and you can't read it anymore, right? <laughs> but as oftentimes what will happen, like in this particular case here, I mean, I, you can't write as fast as you can think. And, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking way out there, and I'm writing back here. I'm having to slow my hand down and slow my thinking down kind of a thing. And sometimes that happens. You, you can all relate to that, right? Um, so as we go through this, if you see that I'm, I'm kind of slowing down on purpose reading these notes, you'll know why. There's, there's a lot of information to cover. There's no way we can get through all of it. That's not my purpose tonight necessarily. Look with me at Colossians chapter number 2 here. Let me, let me introduce the subject that we want to talk about and then kind of explain how I, I'm hoping that to present this and go over this and everything. I don't think so. It's, I, I think it's in my way if, if I don't need it. Can I just move it out of the way? Yeah, there you go. Does that have to stay there? That one? Thank you. Much better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And can everybody hear me okay? All right. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2. We're actually going to start at verse uh, 9. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. He says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. But is that familiar to anybody here? Is that, is that, is that kind of an important passage, right? Um, anyway, he, he goes on to say, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we do thank you that we can spend some time this, this evening in your word and uh, th this whole weekend really allowing your word to renew our minds, 
to strengthen our inner man, to encourage us by reminding us that it really is all about Christ. It's not about us. And therefore, we can rest in him. We can get ourselves out of the picture and see ourselves in Christ as you see us. We do pray that as, uh, as we spend some time this evening, especially dealing with this important topic that we're going to be talking about, that we would, that we would see clearly, thoughtfully, and respond graciously in, um, with, these, with this very important issue. Well, thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, there is a doctrine that is a circulating uh, various places and so forth, and it is in relationship to what that verse says. When it says at verse 10, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. That is, of course, a verse of scripture that we in the grace message certainly feel like is a, a critical passage of scripture, that it is a core doctrine. Would, would you agree with that, that it's a core doctrine? That it's not a side issue, it's not a small issue, it's, uh, it truly is a critical issue. A similar verse of scripture that would certainly be considered uh, a core doctrine, if you'll turn with me over to the book of Ephesians chapter number one, but hold Colossians, Uh, look at Ephesians chapter number one, Ephesians chapter number one, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at verse three, he says, Ephesians one, three, again, this is a passage you're all pretty familiar with, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So once again, if I was to ask you the the issue in verse 3 about being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, if I was to ask you, do you you believe that that's a a core issue, Um, to, to say that you and I as believers are indeed blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, that that's a core issue? important fundamental issue. Would you, would you agree with that, that it's not, that, that these don't seem to be side issues, right? Um, sometimes it's true that there are issues that people discuss within the grace movement and so forth that maybe are not as critical as others, and so you can kind of think, okay, they're, they're fun to talk about and so forth. Um, but when you address the issue about being complete in Christ, whether or not you are complete in Christ, and whether or not you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and whether or not each and every member of the body of Christ actually has the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, is that another core issue? Okay. So when you begin to, to question or suggest uh, otherwise with regard to those, those areas about being complete in Christ, being blessed with all spiritual blessings, and having the indwelling Holy Spirit, it is, it is cause to slow down, to stop, and, and to give some serious listening, some thought to what's being said. Okay. You have heard Brother Jordan say before that you really can't answer a position until you first understand the position. Let me use an illustration. Have you ever in the past tried to show someone the distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul? And their response is always, well, yeah, but what about? Well, yeah, but, well, yeah, but, well, yeah, but. And what you find in situations like that is is you have a grasp of the distinctive ministry of Paul And you're attempting to show another brother or sister in Christ what you've seen from the word, but their yeah buts are getting in the way. It's preventing them from actually seeing whether or not what you're saying is actually there. And so what you're looking for is someone who maybe will just slow down for a minute, for several minutes, okay, slow down for a little bit, and just think through the verses with you. They don't have to agree with you and so forth at all, but what you're asking them to do is, look, Consider the verse this way, and then this one this way, and this one this way. Don't agree with me, but just think about it, consider it, and so forth. You're looking for a heart that's willing to do something like that. If after they do that, and then they still have come to the conclusion, well, yeah, I just don't really see it. Well, you're at least grateful that they seem to demonstrate an open and a willing and honest heart to evaluate what you're saying, and therefore, based on that, well, for whatever reason, I just don't see it, right? And so it is true in order to be able to answer a particular issue, oftentimes, by the way, not always, but oftentimes, you, you want to understand it first. You want to understand what's the logic, what's the thinking, what are the, what are the verses that are being used to support this concept. So what I want to do then, I first want to ex- try to say in a, in a concise way what the issues are that are being said about these issues, about being complete, about being blessed in, in the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
I got to tell you right off the bat, we will not have time to look at all three of the issues, so I'm not going to even try. I'm just going to try to look at one or two of them if we can, and I want to try to give us the tools so that each and every one of us can go back and think through these things like a Berean, like, like, right? And not just these issues, but any issue that comes along down the road, a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, because this is not the, the latest development. It, is not, it won't be the last one ever to come up and so forth. What we want to do is we want to be able to have the spiritual discernment and spiritual wisdom and understanding to be able to take anything that someone's teaching, look at the verses, and then think it through in its context, and then ask questions on both sides of the issue. Okay, if it is true, then that would mean this and so forth. If, it is, if it's not true, then this would be the case. You want to be able to think and reason. Does everybody follow what I'm trying to say here? Okay. So what I want to do, first of all, let me, let me attempt to try to concisely state what the issue is that is being said about the idea of being complete and, and or blessed. Fundamentally, here's what is uh, being conveyed. That being complete in Christ and or blessed, with all, all, all spiritual blessings, so complete, blessed. If you're taking notes, just CB, whatever. Being complete in Christ and blessed with all spiritual blessings is not a reference to our identity in Christ and the identity of each and every individual member of the body of Christ. But rather, it's something that as a member of the body of Christ, we are to seek to attain to. In other words, or to say it a different way, not all members of the body of Christ are complete or blessed with all spiritual blessings, or indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Well, then what's an obvious question? Yeah, that's the obvious question. The obvious question is, well, how then does a member of the body of Christ become complete and or blessed? Well, here's the concept. That basically, through achieving a certain level of spiritual understanding slash edification, or certain groups teach certain ideas, a certain type of suffering, exclusively, exclusively suffering for the mystery, then that's how you become complete. You earn, in a sense, you, you kind of earn the title of complete because you've, in a sense, graduated. Okay? So being complete and blessed with all spiritual blessings is something that's available for all members of the body of Christ, potentially, but not all members, but not all believers are complete or blessed, nor will every single member attain to that distinction. In other words, the idea of being blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and being complete in Christ is not a reference to, nor in the context of, justification. Rather, it is in the context of, and a reference to, the believer's sanctification. Okay, does everybody understand the difference? In other words, when you think about, where is it that you find the phrase, blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? What book? The book of Ephesians. Where is it that you find the phrase, we're complete in Christ? Which book? Colossians. Book of Colossians. So you, you've seen it on the, we've, draw, we've drawn on the board many, many times. When you, go from, when you go from Romans through Philemon, you're going from milk, in a sense, to meat in terms of your edification process. And since the phrase, blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and since the phrase, complete in Christ, is found in the advanced epistles, then therefore it is not related to your identification that you receive in Christ at the moment of your justification. But it is available to everyone in Christ. And it becomes yours as you go through a series of edification, hence your sanctification. Everybody follow what I'm saying? Okay. Now, I've, I've read the information and so forth, and I do believe that that is an accurate representation of the concept that is being taught. I, am, I, I, I genuinely do not want to misrepresent those who are teaching this concept. They are brothers in Christ. I know several of them and so forth. 
I know they trust the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for their Savior. I know in many, many ways there are many things that we would, would see eye to eye on in terms of doctrinally, biblically, the, the Bible issue and so forth, things like that. But this is an area where we're, uh, yeah, uh, we're not on the same page, okay? So it needs to be stated very, very clearly that uh, I, I, do, I do not agree with this concept at all, all right? Um, but I first wanted to make sure that I state fairly and accurately a representation in the, of the, what the concept actually is. So first of all, is there any question on the concept? I'm not asking you whether you agree with it or not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not looking for a rebuttal. I'm just asking do you understand the concept because that's, that's important, okay? Do you see, therefore, that the idea of being complete in Christ, the way that that word is used in that system is complete, therefore, becomes not something related to your identity in Christ, but rather to some kind of a title that you can gain as a result of going through the edification process, right? Almost like, okay, you went through you know, high school, and then you went through college, and then you got your master's degree, and then your PhD. Now you're complete, okay? So the idea is that while the body of Christ as a whole is complete, and while the body of Christ corporately is blessed, not each and every member in the body is complete or blessed, and that the way you become complete or blessed with all spiritual blessings, I'm not, I'm not on purpose leaving that let rest of that phrase out, I'm just, I'm just shortening it up, okay? The way that you become complete or blessed with all spiritual blessings is in some way, shape, or form connected with your willingness and participation in the edification process and or your willingness to participate in suffering for the mystery, okay? So what, whatever, whatever it is, you're not necessarily complete, but you can become that by, by something else. Now, you, you, you know, they, they have their reasons, but I'm saying just fill in the blank. Okay, the point is there's something else you have to do to become complete, okay? Now, what I, what I want to do, therefore, what I, want, what I propose to do this evening, and it is going to take a little bit of time, but I'm not, I don't want to take too much time or waste time or that type of thing. I want to try to do four things this evening. We won't be able to answer all the objections. We won't be able to answer all the things that people say and so forth. I just want to try to present four things to you. First of all, let's attempt to understand, if we're going to give a fair hearing to this concept, don't we need to at least understand where the concept comes from? Did people just wake up one morning and say, oh, hey, I'm not complete in Christ, but then they come up with a way to become complete in Christ. Where does the concept come from? What, what kind of led to that? Or what, or what is being used to support that idea? That, that's what I'm going to do first. Second of all, is what I'd like to do is demonstrate uh, from the scriptures, from Paul's epistles, that that is absolutely not how the Apostle Paul uses those phrases, the phrase, ye are complete in him, and the phrase, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That that's absolutely not the sense in which he uses those words, those phrases. Okay? Number three, I want to demonstrate how he does use those phrases and those words in their context. All right? And then number four, I do want to talk briefly about the danger of this kind of doctrine, of this kind of thinking. I recognize that there are people perhaps in this room tonight that hold to this doctrine. I recognize and I do know there are people listening on the internet right now that do hold to this. And again, I wish no ill will towards you at all. Um, I do obviously have a major difference with, uh, with the position and so forth. And I do ask that uh, you would take the time to uh, um, consider these things. I realize not everybody's going to do so, and that's okay. That's not my point. You know, that's not my objective. My, object, my objective is to present the information as faithfully and, and truthfully to the Word of God as, as I can. All right, so first thing then, let me, let's try to understand where is this concept coming from? What, what's what's kind of leading to this idea? Well, three, I've kind of grouped it into three basic ideas. Now, now there may be others, other ideas as to why people came to this, but I got, it seems, seems to be three basic concepts. 
one of which is what Brian talked about last night, last evening, the concept of the two inheritances. If you will remember the idea of the, the two inheritances, and that is the idea that while all believers are heirs of God, not all believers are joint heirs with Christ. You, you heard the message last night, and Brian went through all that. I'm not going to go through all that again. It was a wonderful message. You've got the book there. You've got the details and so forth. But I know that when I first heard about this idea and concept, and this was several years ago and so forth, one of the things that it brought to my mind that, that troubled me and that I didn't have an answer for, I thought, you know, how is it that if, if the Scripture says that every member in the body of Christ is already forgiven, already blessed with all spiritual blessings, already seated with Christ in heavenly places, already raised up and set with Him, already sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, already complete in Christ, how can they not be a joint heir? You see the kind of concept? And it, this was a question I asked early on. And then so, so, you know, I know I was kind of thinking, well, how could that be true but them not be a joint heir? So it seems to me as I'm thinking through how some of this came about and so forth, is that perhaps, I can't say for sure, but perhaps they had the same problem. So therefore, if you come to the conclusion that not all believers are joint heirs, well then, that means not all believers, at least according to the thinking, not all believers therefore must be complete in Christ. Because in the end, when you come to the judgment seat of Christ, some are going to suffer loss. Therefore, they must not have been complete. And since some are going to suffer loss, therefore, they could, you could not say of them that they're blessed with all spiritual blessings because they didn't get all spiritual blessings. See the concept there? So it seems to me, possibly, that one of the things that, that this comes out of is the idea of the two inheritances. If not all believers are joint heirs, then it naturally leads you to ask other questions about other verses. Okay, number two. The fact is that in Paul's epistles, Paul does use statements such as the following. When talking about the Corinthians, doesn't he say they are carnal and walk as men? When in the book of Philippians, when talking about those that opposed Paul's message, doesn't he refer to people, believers, who he identifies as enemies of the cross? When talking to Timothy, doesn't he indicate that in a, grace ha in a great house, there are not only vessels of honor, but vessels of dishonor? Doesn't the apostle Paul say his own concern about himself to the Corinthians, that he, lest he be a castaway? Doesn't he identify people over in 1 Timothy chapter number 1 who are shipwrecked? Doesn't he tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 2 that there are believers who oppose themselves? Doesn't he warn us in 1 Timothy chapter number 4 clearly that there are those who are going to depart from the faith? Doesn't he say in 1 Timothy chapter number 6 that there are certain, and he names them, who have erred from the faith and that same, the same in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the, those that overthrow the faith of some. And because that's the case, since all those are real, since all of those are phrases referencing real, true, living members of the body of Christ, right? Well, I mean, Paul says, lest he should be cast away. He wasn't cast away yet, right? Okay. But since all, since, since all of those verses were either actually true of real, actual members of the body of Christ or potentially true, such as you can depart from the faith and so forth, well, then you can see how that might lead someone to the conclusion that, well, if someone it does depart from the faith, if someone does wind up being a castaway, if someone is a vessel of dishonor, if someone is an enemy of the cross, then how is it possible that it could be said of that individual that he or she is complete in Christ? 
How is it possible that it could be said of that individual that they indeed were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places when the fact is that when it comes time to the judgments, for the judgment seat of Christ, they will suffer loss, and therefore they could not be blessed. They could have been theoretically, but were not in the end. In fact, doesn't... Look, are you in Colossians chapter number 2 there? Look over to Colossians chapter number 4 this time. Is, is this making sense so far? Look over to Colossians chapter number 4 here. Colossians chapter number 4. Watch this. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. We'll use this verse a little bit later on as well. Look over to Colossians chapter number 4 and verse 12. He says, This Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye... Now, what's the next word there? that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Therefore, since Epaphras, as, as confirmed by the writing of the Apostle Paul, and therefore confirmed by Paul himself, since they are referring to the idea that you may stand perfect and complete, therefore it must be true that not all members of the body of Christ are perfect or complete. That, this is the logic, okay? By the way, I'm not agreeing with that. Is that clear so far? But I am trying to state accurately and clearly not only the position but what is being said and the logic that is being used to support the conclusions of this idea. And this is a big one right here, this, this, this whole concept, that because of all these statements in Paul's epistles that clearly indicate that a number of the members of the body of Christ are going to depart from the faith and, very, and, and so forth, enemies of the cross, that kind of thing. Well, then, therefore, it cannot be said of them, in what sense could it be said that they're complete or blessed? They're not, that kind of a concept, all right? And then the third thing is this. Another way that they use to support and, and, and produce this concept. By the way, again, these are not the only three things, no doubt. I'm just trying to summarize and try to put these things together, and we're limited on time that, that kind of concept. So a third thing is this. So the first one is because of the two inheritance view and so forth. That seems to have, have led to other questions, such as number two here, these statements in Paul's epistles indicating very clearly that some members of the body of Christ are not where they ought to be spiritually. And by the way, is that a true statement? Is it true that members of the body of Christ aren't doing so well in, in, in most cases and so forth? Yeah, okay, so we're not arguing at all with the, with the facts that the verses do say that, that there are going to be enemies of the cross, there are going to be vessels of dishonor, there are going to be those who are cast away and make shipwreck, there are going to be those who oppose themselves, there are going to be those... That, I'm not at all doubting, disputing what the verses actually say is, is, is reality of members of the body of Christ, okay? But the question is, do those verses support the concept, therefore that not every single member of the body of Christ is complete in Christ, or not every member of the body of Christ is blessed with all spiritual blessings in heaven places. See, see, see what I'm saying? Now, and the third uh, uh, thing that seems to, that they're using to support this concept is this. If you will look back at chapter number 2 there, I want you to notice something here. Look over to chapter 2 and verse 10. Chapter 2 and verse 10, it says this. Look at, look, what's the second word in verse 10? It's the word ye. Now, does, is it true that the word ye is plural? Is that true? So here's the logic. Here's the thinking. When that verse says at verse 10, and ye are complete in him, the thinking and the reasoning is this, that corporately or the agency of the body of Christ is complete. So ye collectively are complete in Christ but not necessarily individually. So you have a distinction now that's being made between the corporate and the individual, the corporate and the individuals who make up the corporate, okay? And so the way that they read that verse is since they see this verse and statement is a reference to your sanctification, not a reference to your, what you receive at justification. Everybody understand the difference between the two? Justification are the things that happen to you the moment you trust the blood of Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, right? Sanctification is as, as a believer now, as you grow in an understanding of God's word, so you grow, you mature, you grow. Yeah, the edification process, which, by the way, the scripture does teach an edification process. That's a true statement, all right? So back to this verse here. So the concept is this. The thinking is this. Since Paul is writing to Colossians, and since the Colossians were advanced believers, 
Well, then he's talking to Colossian level type of doctrine. And Colossian level type of doctrine, if you attain to that, then you become complete. Theoretically, potentially, it's available to all members of the body of Christ, but not every member of the body of Christ is there because some, like the Corinthians, were carnal. Some, like that Paul warns about over in 2 Timothy, had made shipwrecks. Some had overthrown the faith of some, so those people were not complete in Christ because they, were not, they had not yet attained to the Corinthian or Ephesian or Philippian level type of edification. All right? So when you read the word ye now, now you've got to start asking a question that, that probably you never asked before. Every time you see the word ye now, if their thinking is correct, Every time you see the word ye now, what you now have to ask, and we're going to do this through this exercise, okay? The question you now have to ask is, is it corporate or is it an individual? Do you feel what I'm saying? That's what we're going to ask as we read these verses. Is it corporate or is it individual? Because that's the concept they're saying here. They're saying that, the, that, that being complete in Christ is, in a sense, a title that you attain to, it's available to everyone in the class, in the body of Christ, that is, but not everyone in the class is going to graduate. Ooh, that sounds like the grace of the Bible, doesn't it? Anyway, <laughs> that's another whole issue. Sorry about that, brother. <laughs> I shouldn't apologize to him. He faithfully taught the whole thing, did he not? You know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's another whole issue. Okay, so you understand at least some of the verses or reasoning as to what's leading to and, and that they're using to support the concept the idea that, that not every member of the body of Christ is complete or blessed all spiritual blessings. Everybody understand where that seems to be coming from, okay? All right, now let me move on here. Um, I think I said this. The ye is said to, to indicate that being complete is available and, obtain, uh, and potentially obtainable theoretically to all members of the body of Christ, but not all members of the body of Christ. Attain. Okay, I, I read that, didn't I? All right, okay, sorry. All right, now, now let's move on to the solution, right? No, and I, I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm at the second point of what I'm trying to cover right now, right? Is that right in my notes here? Is it the third one? Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> anyway, I don't always do good reading my notes. You got to preach. I just got to usually preach, all right? So I apologize for that. Okay. Well, listen, the, the real simple solution, by the way, quickly, 2 Timothy chapter number 11 here. The real simple solution to the aforementioned confusion or ideas that are used to lead to or support, supposedly, this, these views is, it, it, look at this verse here. Look at this verse. Look at, look at 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. What did I say? Well, I'm not sure what I said. I think I, was, I think I was trying to say it, and I was reading these notes, and I was, my mouth was saying one thing, my mind's saying that. What I do want at this point, I want 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Is that, what, is that what I want? Okay, good. He says, but I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the what? You've heard the word simplicity, the phrase simplicity in Christ a couple of times already this weekend. And it's, think about that word simplicity. There's, what, what two words look like they make up that one word? Simple city. Think about that, simple city. It's a city that's simple to get into, and it's simple to stay in. Christ, that simplicity is found in Christ. One of the, one of the, things when it comes to discerning whether or not something is consistent with the doctrines of grace that the Apostle Paul taught is ask the question, how simple is it? If it's too confusing, if it's too complicated and so forth, you know what? Back up a little bit and say, you know what? Let's, let's try to keep this simple, okay? The simplicity that is in Christ. So that means this, that the basic solution with the idea, that the simple solution with the idea that these phrases about enemies and shipwreck and overthrow and depart from the faith, 
that since those exist, therefore not all believers are complete in Christ and blessed. There, there's a real simple answer to that. And the simple answer is this, that the Apostle Paul teaches the fact that while all believers have a, have a particular position in Christ, not all believers are going to act consistent in their practice. We call that standing and state. Is that a new concept to anybody here? How many years has that been around? Why are we departing from the simple answers to complicated answers? It makes no sense. I don't think it's consistent with the simplicity that's in Christ. You see, there is, the, 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 Paul's epistles do teach the doctrine that, that we have this identity in Christ. Therefore, we should have a conduct that matches that identity. We do have a standing in Christ. Therefore, we want our state here and now to be consistent with that standing. We have a position in Christ. Therefore, we want to allow the doctrines to get in us and operate and work in us and manifest a practice, a lifestyle that will be consistent with our identity and position in Christ. When we talk about our position, our standing, our identity, that is a reference to who God makes us to be in Christ the moment we trust the blood of Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, and it is a complete package given to us solely, completely, out of the kindness and grace and love of Almighty God based upon the value of the blood of Jesus Christ alone. Any amens to that? Period. You can add nothing to that at all. And at any time, if you add anything to that concept, you are destroying the essential, basic doctrine of grace. See that? That's what's happening. Look with me, if you would, over to the book of Romans, chapter number 8. Look at Romans, chapter number 8. Watch this verse. Think about this. Romans, chapter number 8, and verse 31. Romans, chapter number 8, verse 31. He says, what shall we then say to these things? By the way, what things? I'm going to jump back, if you would, to verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Are you with me, by the way? And whom he called, them he also did what? There's your justification, would you agree? And whom he justified, them he also, what? Listen, it is a complete package. Would it be accurate to say that the body of Christ absolutely is going to be glorified with the Lord Jesus Christ? Would it be accurate to say that each and every member of the body of Christ is going to be glorified with the Lord Jesus Christ? That verse says, whom he justified, them he also glorified. Please keep that verse in mind a little bit later for the message, right? Keep reading. He says, now to verse 31. He says, what shall we then say to these things? Well, that's a great question. What shall we say to these things? Should, should, yeah, say it loud, Ted. Should we say things like this? Well, God, maybe I'll be glorified. Maybe I'll be complete if I complete an edification program. Maybe I will be blessed if I go through a particular type of suffering. See, in my mind, I don't, I don't see it as being consistent with the very nature of the question Paul is asking here, right? He says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who does the who include? Someone said it. You got it. It includes yourself. Even when you oppose what God is doing, even if, therefore, you oppose yourself, that is who you are in Christ, even if you wind up being an enemy of the cross, and will some be that? Absolutely. They were in Paul's day. They're here today. We're talking about believers even. Even if you wind up being a castaway, even if you depart from the faith, you know what? 
God is still going to glorify you. How come? Because you're faithful? No, my gosh, oh, God, no. He's going to glorify you because it's a promise he made to his son. Because he's faithful to his word to his son. You see that? You're being justified. You're being, therefore, glorified. It's a complete package. It's not a piecemeal package. Look at the next verse now. Watch this. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for some of us, only those who become complete, only those who achieve a certain level of edification. He, see, see, we would, all of us, even they would totally disagree, don't read that verse that way. They would totally agree that Christ was delivered up for us all. They would completely agree with that. Look at the next statement. How shall he not with him also, what's, what's the next phrase? Freely give us all things. And the answer to that verse is Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us. That's the same us. Why make a distinction that does not exist there? He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. The blessing is in Christ. The completeness in Christ. I'm getting way ahead of my notes here. I'm getting excited and amped and my blood pressure is going up, right? You can kind of tell there, right? But you see, that you, you see, right? And listen, this is Romans level doctrine. If the Apostle Paul is later on going to teach some advanced level doctrine that is required in order for someone to become complete and blessed, shouldn't the Apostle Paul, at least in Romans, have told us that we need to get to that point? Some would suggest that that's what he's doing in Romans chapter 16, but he doesn't say it that way at all. Where does the Apostle Paul in this entry-level doctrine, and when I say entry, I'm not being derogative to the doctrine, but where does he teach us in the Romans, Corinthians, Galatians level doctrine that, you know what, you're really not complete yet. You need, in order to become complete, you need Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians type doctrine to become complete. Listen, let me stop here for just a second. It is true that there is a difference between the spiritual edification and level of information in Romans, Corinthians, Galatians as compared to Ephesians, Philippians, Christ. And that's a true statement. You do have to study this information as a prerequisite to this information. That he, some things he mentions in Ephesians you won't understand unless you get them out of Romans and that kind of thing. Everybody understand that concept. So I'm not disagreeing with the concept and the fact that there are different levels of edification. edification ah, I can't even talk. Pardon me. Okay. There are different levels of education as you go through the information, but the different levels of education, Paul doesn't link that with becoming complete. He doesn't hold becoming complete out as your graduation certificate in that sense, if I could use it that way, okay? That verse right there says, again, I, I think about that verse. I scratch my head about that verse because that verse just flat out would not be true if you're not blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And how would you know that to us in Romans is different than to us in Ephesians? See, look at, look at, uh, look at, look at Romans 8.32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall I not with him also freely give us? If it's freely given, then it is, is it something you have to strive to attain to? Is it something that you have to be faithful to in order to get? I, I, I don't think so. See that? So again, it's just the difference between the standing and the state. Look with me if you would. Again, the point being that it's, it's a, simple, a simple difference between our standing and our state and so forth. That uh, our standing, our position, our identity is a reference to who God made us to be in Christ the moment we trusted the blood of Christ. Our state is a reference to the exhortation that Paul gives in his word for us to live consistent with that identity. Such as phrases like walk worthy. Such as phrases like put off, put on. Such as phrases like, be not conformed, but be transformed. Those things like that, right? The phrases, in Christ, in Him, in whom, in the beloved, 
all refer to the identity and union that the believer gets in Christ, the absolute split second and moment that they trust the blood of Jesus Christ alone. It's all about Christ. Who are we in Him? How does God see us in Him? And the phrases that are in question, complete and blessed, they're all said to be complete, where? In Him. It's an identification issue. It's a statement of identification, not of edification. All right? Because you have the identification, therefore you do want to get edified. You see, by the way, you see how there's a motivation issue here, too, as well. If, I, if I'm all, let me ask it this way. If I am already forgiven of all of my sins, by the way, is that true? Okay, question. Therefore, are there a couple of different, excuse me, a couple of different ways that I could respond to that, that information? Yeah. What are the two ways I could respond to that information? It, it, if, if, I, if I am truly forgiven of all my sins, one way that I could respond to the information is just go, hey, fantastic, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, now I'm going to live like the devil while I'm here on the earth. Is that a true possibility? Yeah. Some of y'all know that, right? Okay. I got the flesh too, all right? That's a real possibility. By the way, people who hate grace object to that possibility, don't they? Oh, you're going to say you can go live in sin if you teach them that. Yeah. Grace wouldn't be grace if you didn't have the license and ability to abuse it. By definition. But there's another possible response to the understanding that you truly are forgiven of all of your sins, past, present, and future. What's the other possible response? Isn't it thankfulness? What would you say? It's your gratitude. Thankfulness. Now, are both of those motivators? You betcha. If I'm forgiven of all my sins, and then I just go live out here in sin and everything, but if I'm a believer, now I'm going to become under some kind of conviction, especially if other believers are watching me, especially if I'm going to a legalistic church. Now, see, now i got a motivation. Oh, I better do right because God's not happy with me. That's a motivator. But on the other hand, if I choose to not sin because I'm already forgiven, I'm already loved, I'm already sealed, and so forth, so I want to serve God out of gratitude, that's also a motivator, isn't it? Which one is Christ in me? Is it me over here saying, hey, I can go sin, so now I can live in sin, but now I'm under guilt, so now, now I better get right. Is that Christ in me doing that? The answer is no. But on the other hand, as a believer, I'm appreciating the grace of God, I appreciate His love for me and everything, and I sin, and I go, oh, you know what? That, that was just wrong for me to do that, Lord. I, I, and I recognize it was wrong. God, I thank you I'm forgiven of the sin. Help me to understand and learn from this so that I don't do this again. God, I thank you that you, you, your love for me didn't fail. That's also motivating. See the difference there? So if as believers we say I've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, except I'm not necessary. Uh, no, no, let me say it. If, I've been, if, he's, if he's freely given us all things to a certain point, but that in order to be blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in order to, to be complete in Christ, I now need to go do something, fill in the blank, whatever you say you got to do. There's a motivation, isn't there? What now becomes the motivation? Yeah, there's the potential motivation of me trying to work and so forth. See that? That's a problem. That's an issue. So when we talk about the phrase, the phrase is in Christ, in Him, in whom, in the beloved, all those are references to an identity that we receive the moment you trusted the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation because it's in Him that's the issue. Now, let's talk for a few minutes here about the word ye because the Apostle Paul uses the word ye quite often and not just the Apostle Paul. But let's take the test. Let's go to a few, several passages where the Apostle Paul uses the word ye and let's just ask the question, is Paul thinking, and should the audience he's writing to, should they be thinking, oh, this is corporately, but not necessarily individually? Okay? Let me give you a, let, let's just start reading some, right? Is that, is that okay? Can we do that? Look over with me, first of all, to Romans chapter 1. Look over to Romans chapter number 1. 
Romans chapter number 1. Let me start demonstrating to you some of the major difficulties with, with this whole concept. Look over to Romans chapter number 1. Watch this. I'm going to start at Romans chapter number 1. I'm going to start at verse uh, uh, 6. Romans 1, 6. He says, among whom are, what's the word there? So he says, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? Okay, so here we go now. We need to ask the question. Is the ye there, is it corporate or is it individual? Let me ask a different question. Had that question never even been brought to your mind, would you have ever even thought to ask that question? Do you see the problem? Who is Paul writing to? He's not writing to the city of Rome. He's not even writing to every single individual living in Rome. There are a lot of unsaved people in Rome. He's writing to the saints. And he uses the word ye. So who are the ye? The saints. And who are the saints? The ye. The body of Christ. See what I'm saying there? So to make a distinction, there's corporate and there's individual. It is a false distinction that is not supported by the the, the just plain reading of the verses, especially when you ask the question in connection with when the Romans got this epistle, how would they have known to ask that question? When he says ye, he's writing to the group of believers. He's writing to all of them. And there, there had to have been a way for them to know No, yes, I'm writing to all of you, but not really. You see that there? So if we're going to say that the ye in Colossians 2.10 is is making a distinction, if we're going to say the way we should read the ye in Colossians 2.10 is that we need to make the distinction between the corporate and the individual, then in order to be consistent, don't we need to read every time you use the word ye the same way? Is, Is that unfair to say that? No, I think it's consistent to say that, right? Let me have you... Think about another one. Go with me, if you would, to chapter 6 of Romans. Go to chapter number 6 of Romans. Look at this. Let's ask the question again. Romans chapter 6, this time, verse 11. If the use of the word ye, that Paul is distinguishing between the agency and the individual, and therefore we should do the same, between the corporate and the individual, and therefore we should do the same, and therefore the Romans should have known that and done the same. Well, now let's think about Romans 6 and verse 11. Look at that verse. That verse says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So question, is the body of Christ, corporately, is the body of Christ dead indeed in sin and alive unto God? Yes or no? Come on, look, convince me. You, okay, yeah. yeah no, no, no. The body of Christ is dead indeed unto sin. Is each and every member of the body of Christ dead indeed unto sin? So if, so if that's true, would you have even known, would they have even known that the way they should read the word ye as, oh, we've got to make sure this distinction between ye is corporate, and, and, and individual, and if the ye is corporate, but not necessarily true of each and every individual, then doesn't that change how you read that verse? It would have to change it. It demands consistency. That verse says, likewise reckon ye yourselves also to be dead and deed unto sin. If that's only true corporately and of the agency, but not necessarily true of the individual, then what's the logical question to ask? How how do I become dead to sin and alive unto God? I think he's talking to saved people. So here you have saved people who were baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but they're not dead to sin and alive unto God. Well, pray tell, how are they going to get that way? Now, and I can hear the objections already. No, 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 John, we're not teaching that verse that way. Right. That's my point. You're not being consistent. If the ye in Colossians is corporate, and not necessarily individual, and that they should understand that's how to read that verse, then why do we not that apply that every time Paul uses the word ye? It's, I, I, I believe it's inconsistent, which is one reason I don't all believe what the conclusions are. Okay? Now, question, are you dead to sin alive unto God? 
But are you individually dead to sin in light of the gospel? How do you know? Isn't that interesting? I mean, know you not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Christ Jesus, so the ye has to be the so many of us. And the so many of us has to be the ye. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. When we make this distinction between the corporate and the individual, we are creating an absolute fundamental problem. Look with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. There is a question that the Apostle Paul asks in verse 13, and it's the first question. What is the question? See what's happening? See, one of the very issues that was happening at Corinth is because of doctrinal differences, it was creating the concept, the suggestion that Christ was divided. And so that very concept is what's happening here, is that we've got corporate and individual, and what's true of the corporate may not be true of the individual. In order for it to be true of you as an individual, you have to achieve certain things. So indeed, we ask the question, is Christ divided? Look with me at another verse, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, Paul talks about the very nature of the body of Christ. He says it this way. Look over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, and I'm going to have you start at verse 12. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse 12. He says, for as the body is what? Is one and hath many members... And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is what? See that there? What's true of the body of Christ is true of Christ. And what's true of the body of Christ is true of every member in the body of Christ. And what's true of every member of the body of Christ is true of the body of Christ and true of Christ. That the absolute, not theoretical, but the absolute union, not just of the body of Christ, the agency, the corporate, if you want to call that. Okay, Paul, anyway, the agency, the corporate. It's absolutely true of the corporate in Christ. It's true of each and individual in the body. After all, you can't have the body of Christ without having members. It doesn't exist. Look with me a little bit further. He says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but what? See how the Apostle Paul in his own day was having to deal with the concepts that were seeking to lead people to the, to the idea that there was this schism in the body, that there was the two different classes, so to speak, in the body, all right? And, and, and at the time, it was also based upon doctrinal issues. Look with me at verse, if you would, um, look at verse 27. Look at verse 27. Look at verse uh, 27. Watch this. He says, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. What's true of the body is true of each and every member. What's true of each and every member is true of the body because you're in Christ. Okay, we're going to do something right now. Everybody stand up. Please, stand up. Can you stand up? Do your knees hurt? Does your backside hurt? Do you need a break? Okay, stretch out, okay? Stretch out, stretch that neck a little bit. Okay, you know. Okay, you can sit back down. Okay, now there was a reason for that. The reason was we all needed a break. (laughs) Really, I mean that seriously, okay? Because I'm only halfway through my notes, and and I'm going to start going fast right now. I really mean that. I'm only halfway through, but I'm going to start going real fast right now, but I don't want to go too fast. So I'm, I'm going to try to, I know, we're, I know it's been a long day. I know it's, um, I know everybody's tired, but don't lose me in these next several points, these verses we want to look at, because after all, it isn't what I say. It's about what the verses say in their context, right? So I just figured, hey, let's just take a break for a second. Okay, is that all right? <laughs> all right. All right, look at Ephesians 1 now. Watch this. Look at Ephesians 1. Let's continue to ask these questions here. Sometimes a little break's good, right? So let's ask the same question here. Look at Ephesians 1. I'm going to start at verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed... Now, what's the next word there? <laughs> Us, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen... What's the next word there? And the next two words. Okay, so where is the choosing? The choosing is in the person of Christ. The being blessed is in the person of Christ. Okay, now stay in the same chapter. This time come with me to verse 13. Verse 12, verse 12. He says that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. In other words, Paul became a believer in Christ before the Ephesians did, right? You understand that? So now look at the next verse, and you're going to see all of a sudden the use of the word ye again here. He says, in whom ye also trusted. Okay, now who is the ye? Isn't it the us in verse 3? And doesn't it include the Apostle Paul and so forth? Were any of the Ephesians having any problems with sin? You go read Ephesians chapter 4, 5, 6. You, look, look at what he says, for example. What, why would he have to say it this way? In, look at chapter number 4 here. Watch this. Look over to chapter number 4 at verse 17. 417, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles, walk in the vanity of your mind, and so forth. Now, why would Paul have to say that to the Ephesians if it was not a possibility for them to do so? Why would the Apostle Paul have to say later on in the same chapter things like put off, put on? Things like putting away lying. Wasn't that suggesting that some of the Ephesians wore lying? Why would the Apostle Paul have to say, let him that stole steal no more? Wouldn't that suggest that some of the Ephesians were having problem with thievery? Why would he have to say, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth? If, 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 didn't that tell you they were having that problem? Why, why would he have to say, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be a kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven? Would, wouldn't he have to say that? Why would he have to say that if they weren't having problems with these relationship issues? But wait a minute now. If they were experiencing issues like don't steal anymore, don't lie anymore, and have a forgiving, tender heart one to another, the, uh, the doctrines of don't steal, don't lie, don't, don't be unforgiving to one to another, is that Romans-level doctrine or is that Ephesians-level doctrine? Where do you learn those concepts? You learn that in Romans-level. So here you have Paul writing to Roman-level believers who he says, guys, you need to really stop doing this stuff. Oh, but you're blessed with all spiritual blessings already. So it is wrong to conclude that the way you become blessed is that you arrive there at, by getting to Ephesian-level doctrine. He's already said in chapter 1 that they are blessed. He doesn't say once you stop lying, once you stop stealing, and once you start forgiving one another, then you become blessed. He says you are already blessed. Look at Ephesians back to chapter number 1. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 13 once again. Notice he says, In whom ye also trusted. Let's ask the question, who is the... Did, did you get reference? Verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 13, okay? He says, In whom ye also trusted. Okay, question. Who is the ye? Is it the corporate or the individual? The answer is yes, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the true answer. But, 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 but let's ask it this way. That verse says in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Who did they believe to get saved? Didn't they trust the blood of Jesus Christ for their salvation? Yes or no? Okay. So is it fair to say there that the ye is a reference to people who trusted Christ? after they heard the gospel. Is that fair to say? So if you're going to say the ye is corporate, but not necessarily individual, then I got another question for you. Was the body of Christ ever lost? No! Was the body of Christ ever lost and going to hell? The answer is no. So did the body of Christ ever need to trust the blood of Christ and be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? No, individuals trusted Christ. And when you as an individual trust Christ, you get put into the agency. 
So they, they don't make this distinction. Does, you see, does that make sense what I'm saying? You know, in, in whom ye trusted. Who individually? I trusted the blood of Jesus Christ. See that? And, and you can keep reading. It. You just, I'm saying ask that question through the use of the word ye. Every time you see the word, see if it makes sense and to read it that way. The answer is it doesn't make sense to read it that way. How would the Ephesians have known to read it, read it that way? How would they have known? Tell me. Go with me quickly now to the book of, uh, uh, let's go to Colossians 2 now. We're going to spend the balance of our time here in Colossians 2. And, I, and again, I, I know it's long, I, a long evening and so forth. I'll, I'll try, to, try to wrap some of this up, make some sense. Oh, by the way, by the way, go back to Ephesians 5. I forgot a verse here. <laughs> Watch this. Again, the ye, Ephesians 5. Look at verse Ephesians 5, 8. Ephesians 5, 8. He says, for ye were sometimes darkness. Okay, if you're going to make the ye corporate, then was the corporate sometimes darkness? No. no. Again, the question is, was the corporate ever lost? It says, for ye were sometimes darkness. He's talking about the individuals that make up the Ephesians. In this case, in this book, the Ephesians, of course. He's, he, he's saying these things because he's speaking to the group that are comprised of individuals, and he's seeking to help them walk by faith in their identity in Christ. See that there? He says, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's a verse that clearly identifies the, document, the idea that we talk about standing and state, position and practice, identity and walk. See, that verse, it's in that verse. Both, both ideas are in that verse right there. Go with me, if you would, to uh, Colossians chapter number 2 now. Okay, now, the, the big verse here. <laughs> Colossians 2.10. Look at this one. What we want to do is this. We're going to ask the similar questions, the use of the word ye, but we really want to understand why does Paul say what he says anyway in verse 10 when he says, and ye are complete in him. Is it because he is trying to identify to these Colossians that there's some new level of edification that he wants them to attain to? Is that the reason he says the verse here? Is that the issue in the context? I submit to you, no, not at all. In Colossians chapter number 2, well, man, there's so much to say. In Colossians, Colossians chapter number 2, basically, the Apostle Paul identifies four specific attacks by the adversary that the Colossians were facing. They were actual, real, spiritual, doctrinal attacks they were facing at that time, and actually go on throughout the whole dispensation of grace. So they're, they're still alive here today. You can see them identified as the following. Look at verse 4. And this I say, I'm at 2, 4, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So there's the concept, there's the attack number one. Someone's going to come along and seek to entice them, to, to beguile them with enticing words. Look at, with me at verse 8. Here's the second one. Beware lest any man spoil you through, and then those things. There's a second one. Go with me to, chat, to verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you. In, and there's the third one. And now look at verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in, and there's the fourth one. So the Apostle Paul identifies four specific attacks of the adversary that are seeking, that, that were designed to undermine the Colossians' belief in and operating in a clear understanding of who Christ is and their identity in Christ. Everybody follow me so far? So let's go down and read these. Let's just kind of quickly go through this. Watch, watch his logic here. Watch his thinking. He says, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you. Who's the ye? Who's the you? There's no difference between the two. There's no artificial difference. Paul, Paul is not suggesting here in the Colossians would not have read it. Oh, corporately, he's worried about us, but individual, maybe he's not worried about us. They wouldn't have read it that way. He says, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So question, does Paul want these Colossians to go on to further understanding? Yes or no? He clearly does. Watch this now. So he's talking about of Christ. Now watch this in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, question then. 
if all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ, he says, in whom are hidden. By the way, the hidden things have now been revealed, right? By whose writings? The Apostle Paul. So if the hidden things have now been revealed, written and revealed by the Apostle Paul, and if all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ, where do you suppose you ought to go in your Bible to discover, to mine out the riches of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are in Christ? Where should you go? Paul's epistles. See that? So it's a statement about what's in Christ, where those treasures of wisdom and can be found. It's not a statement of them trying to attain to some different level, but of appreciating what is already in Christ and available for their understanding through the Word. Now look at the warning here. And this I say, the reason I'm telling you this, this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. In other words, people were going to come along and suggest to the Colossians that were, there were places that wisdom and knowledge could be found, discovered, mined, other than in Christ. See that there? How simple that is. If all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ, then if we want wisdom and knowledge, where should we look? You look where it is. You heard the old joke about the, the guy that robs the bank, and he gets caught, so they throw him in jail, and five years later, he's out of the bank again, and, and so, obviously, he's out of jail, and so, so he goes back and robs another bank, and so they arrest him, throw him in jail again, and five years later, he's back out of jail, and he goes back and robs the bank again. The, the cop says, dude, what? Or the judge says, what, what are you doing? Why, why, why do you keep robbing the bank? The guy says, well, because that's where the money is. <laughs> So, listen, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. Why would you look anywhere else? And someone's going to come along and seek to beguile the Colossians into thinking that they can find the treasures of wisdom and knowledge somewhere else. Keep reading. So, see how how he's explaining this to them? So, he says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. See, they're doing pretty well doctrinally. They're they're holding, they're holding ground, right? See that? He says, my watch verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, Lord, so walk ye in him. Is that corporate or individual? Yeah, it's both. Are the Colossians as a group supposed to walk in Christ? But the Colossians as a group are not going to, going to walk in, the Christ, in Christ unless what? Unless individuals make a decision to do so. See that? It's an artificial distinction saying, well, it's corporate or individual. It's, it's not the right question to ask. He's, he's, he's seeking to, to call all of them to walk in their identity in Christ, but it starts with an individual. See that? When he says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. Did the body of Christ need to receive Christ? No. Individuals received Christ. Keep reading. He says, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, now, here comes the section. Beware of seeing a man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, out the tradition of men, out the rumors world, not of Christ. You've got four issues there. Those issues are going to come along to seek to spoil, to corrupt the edification process in these believers. Now, it's Paul's answer. Paul's answer is, listen, the thing that will continue your edification process is not philosophy and vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. Rather, listen, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So where should we be looking to our identity in Christ? And guess what? Ye are complete in him. You're already there. So why are you going to philosophy? If you are already complete in Christ, what is it you think philosophy is going to add to your position? If you're already complete in in Christ, because that's where the completeness is, if you're already complete in Christ, then what is it you think that the rudiments of the world are going to add to you? If you're already complete in Christ, then what is it that you think that the traditions of men are going to give you that you don't have? You see, all of the, all the things that Paul is saying, beware lest he lists those four things, all these four things are suggesting you're lacking something. So the answer to, well, you're really lacking something that you need to continue your edification process the answer is, listen, you're already complete in Christ. Do you, you see what he's saying here? He, what, these, what these things are suggesting to you, that, they, that they're going to lead you to think that you're going to add to your edification, you're already complete in Christ. The concept that you have to go through some edification system 
or, or, or some other kind of thing. To become complete is the very thing Paul is warning about in the verse. He says, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. I, I love the way he says it. Look, look at verse 9. He says, guess what, guys? He says, look, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And guess what? You're complete in him. And guess what? He's the head of all principality and power. He, he sandwiches. You guys like sandwiches? You heard about the poor family that says we were so poor. All we had was jam sandwiches. We took two pieces of bread and jammed them together. Listen, the sandwich, he, he sandwiches you, he sandwiches that statement. Ye are complete in him. He sandwiches right between two other statements. The statement is, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then he puts the meat in there. They're complete in him. And then he puts the other piece of bread. And he's the head of all principality and power. Imagine saying, Imagine saying this, for in him dwells all the fullness of Godhead bodily, and, and he is the head of all principality and power, and you theoretically are complete in him. You potentially are complete in him. You might be complete. Oh, you can tell this is incredible that they're teaching this. And I know some of these guys. And listen, I have no ill will towards them. I genuinely don't. These are brothers in Christ. Fellow members of the body of Christ. But their teaching's not right. It's just flat out wrong. Look at, keep, look at the ye. If the ye in verse 10, if, ye, if, if we are led to believe that there's this distinction between the corporate and the individual, then shouldn't we read the ye in verse 11 the same way? Look at verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What event was that? That's the cross. That's Romans 6. Then that's justification doctrine. The idea that there's no justification level doctrine in Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians is nonsense. That's justification level doctrine. And, and to say that the ye is corporate only and not necessarily individually, then that means there are individuals in the body of Christ that, were, that have not yet been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That means that there are members of the body of Christ, verse 12, that haven't necessarily been baptized in his death. Is that a problem? I think so. He says, verse 12, bury with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith. Well, not if the ye is corporate only and only theoretically individually for each individual member. Let's move on. Because you, you, you can do this now. You, you, you see enough. You can see. You can read this through logically and reasonably. And, 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 you know, but watch what he does now. Verse 20. He says, wherefore, verse 20, wherefore, wherefore if ye be dead with Christ. Well, is that corporate or individual? You see the problem? If you say the ye is only corporate and theoretically possible for each and every individual once they go through a certain level of edification, because I do think we should be consistent with how we define the ye here, well, then, won't, then aren't you saying that only the agency is dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world and therefore not necessarily all individuals are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. But you have another problem in the verse. Because if you agree that the ye there is the agency, and you say that the agency is dead with Christ, what is the agency doing in the verse? <laughs> verse 20, the agency is submitting himself to human ordinances. That's Romans level doctrine. <laughs> Does it make sense how I'm saying this? Am I, am I totally... Watch chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. If the ye is only the agency, only those who are complete, and he's already told them that they are complete, so they've graduated, why would he have to tell them to seek the things which they are above they're already doing it. 
If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Listen, if that's not true of you individually, you got a problem in terms of your eternal security. It is true of the corporate, the agency, but it's also, excuse me, it's also true of you individually. He says, look at verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is Christ the life only of the corporate? Or is he also your life? Is Christ the life of even those who were enemies of the cross? Is Christ the life of those who were even, those who made shipwreck, those who left the faith and so forth? Absolutely. Watch what he says. When Christ, who is a life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him where? That's the connection with Romans 8.30. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. Listen, what, let me, one other quick point about this, and then we're going to move on to point number four, and I'll go fast on that. According to that system, ye is, some, is a title you receive when you've attained a certain level of maturity. Do you understand the concept there? Does Paul say that the Colossians are complete? At least those who he, in that system he thought they were. Right? So if you do earn the title of complete, then according to that system, you're up there. You're, you're advanced. Right? You're, you're, you're maturing. You're, you're at the mature level. You're functioning pretty good. Right? Well, but watch verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. What's the first one listed? <laughs> Question. Is fornication, the fact that we shouldn't do it, <laughs> is that Romans-level doctrine or is it Colossians-level doctrine? So here you've got, in that system, you've got people who Paul says in chapter 2, you are complete, you're advanced, you've graduated, you're up there, man, you're functioning. Oh, by the way, stop fornicating. And then while you stop fornicating, also stop having inordinate affection, stop doing unclean things, stop your, your evil concupiscence, stop your covetousness, which is idolatry. Do we have a problem here? To say that the idea of complete and blessed are advanced level titles, well, then you have Paul in Ephesians, Colossians giving advanced level titles to people who are clearly still struggling with things Paul taught based on Romans 6 type doctrine. Let's wrap this up. Let me just quickly say four, what I think are four real dangers of this kind of doctrine. Fundamentally, it has the believer focusing on him or herself. Because if you buy into this system, what is the logical question that you need to ask? What do I need to do to become complete? What do I need to do to become blessed? So fundamentally, it has the believer focusing on himself or herself. Number two, it causes a rift in the body of Christ in that it produces those who think they are on track to become complete and see it, see the doctrine, compared to those who just don't see it. Oh, poor saints, they just don't see it. And therefore, they're not on track to become complete. Yeah, so it produces a rift in the body of Christ as far as God is concerned doesn't exist. But practically speaking, that's what it does. Number three, in a system like that, there can be no real rest and joy and peace. Because in that system, you always have to keep striving. Paul does say strive. You have to keep pressing towards the mark. He does say press towards the mark, but not in the sense that they're using it. In that system, if you're trying to attain the title of complete, thinking that that's how you're going to honor God, because that's the concept. We all, Paul does want us to be edified, right? And we should want to be edified. But if that's, if that's something that, oh man, it's a badge I got to get, get out there and so forth. Do you know your flesh? Your flesh will Take the charge and try to do that. That's the danger.
And number four, it fails to remember that everything of any value, of any eternal worth, of any kind, even the reward at the judgment seat of Christ, is all received on the basis of the principle of the free gift, the grace of God, because of the value and work of Jesus Christ and the merit of his shed blood. It's all based on that. And if we remember that, then we can have joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Does God want us to be edified? Yes. Does he want us to grow to maturity? Yes. Does he want us to press towards the mark? Yes. But any system that suggests to accomplish those things in our life is to any way, degree, any shape, any form, somehow connected with our flesh being able to do it by, by pressing, striving, that kind of thing. It is absolutely false and wrong. And your flesh will adopt something like that because our flesh wants to perform. Rather, the answer is just focus on who you are in Christ. Rest in the confidence that you are complete. Not because of something that you can add to some position that God gave you in Christ, but because God has already made you that in Christ. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we can spend a little time here in your word with, with a, a core issue. And there are many other core issues as well, but Father, this one certainly seems to be on the top of that list of the seven that you tell us endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body. that We all share in common the things you've given us in Christ. We pray, Father, that these things that we've thought about tonight, that we would, would have open hearts and that uh, those who perhaps would disagree with us on this, that we might be loving and, and, and tender and kind and, and, and manifest the gentleness of Christ, though disagreeing with, uh, the, with those who would see these verses differently. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the goodness that you've expressed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.